welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to have you here today, Dr. Chilapa from uh, the University of Maryland. Uh, Dr. Chilapa is uh, a distinguished professor, university distinguished professor, Minta Martin, professor of electrical engineering, and he's also chair of the EC department at the University of Maryland. He received uh, several awards, uh, and uh, starting with the KS2 uh, prize for, from uh, the uh, Patent Recognition Society. He's also a recipient of uh, several technical achievement uh, and a uh, meritorious award <coughs> from the SP Society as well as the Computer Society. And he was uh, recently awarded the inaugural leadership award by the IEEE Biomedical Council. And he also uh, was recognized for uh, several leadership and uh, excellence uh, awards, I guess, at the, at the University of Maryland. And uh, he's also an outstanding uh, ECD graduate uh, by, uh, from Purdue. And in 2016, he was also uh, appointed or, or uh, Yes, appointed as a distinguished alumni of the Indian Institute of Science. This is in Bangalore, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, he's also served as, uh, as the EIT of the PAMI and uh, several other journals. He's uh, also a Golden Core member of the IEEE Computer Society and uh, served also as a DL for the, uh, the Sickle Processing Society. Uh, he's a fellow of several societies. IEEE, IATR, OSA, you name it, he's a fellow of And uh, it's a pleasure to have him here uh, to, uh, today to talk to us about the deeper things of uh, deep faces. And uh, Thank I don't know how deep you're going to go into it. <laughs> Very deep. I need, I may have to be pulled out after I'm done. Thank yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the wonderful introduction, uh, Hamid. And, uh, I'm happy to see some of my friends I've known for a long time. And uh, so today I want to talk about a project that we have been involved uh, with uh, IARPA, which is Intelligence Advanced Research Project Activity. It's one of the new um, agencies. It's been there for more than 10 years or so. And um, uh, this, this thing started in 2014. Um, and I think uh, there's one more year of uh, this project. It's a four-year effort uh, to build a system for unconstrained phase verification. So academic career is typically about 40 years. You know, you start when you're 28, and then you're supposed to work till you're at least 70, 60, you know, and so on. So you go through various phases. You do theory. Sometimes you do this, you do that, and towards... Uh, after 30 years, you say, maybe I should build something, <laughs> right? So this is about building uh, a face verification system. And uh, some interesting things are going on in computer vision and, and pattern recognition. And so I'll, uh, again, I got my PhD from Purdue in 1981. This is my 36th <laughs> year. So what happens is that you know some history, right? And if you don't know history, as they say, you are prone to repeat the same mistakes. Uh, so at least, so I want to talk to you about a little bit of history of computer vision and neural networks and so on and what has changed since 2012 and uh, w what we have done in, in an important problem of unconstrained phase verification and recognition and, and all kinds of stuff. So uh, traditional approach in computer vision, you have data of various kinds, images, videos, infrared, uh, radar, millimeter wave, if you go through the TSA thing, you know, that's a millimeter wave. It, it tells you the little things that you have in your pockets and so forth, right? So you have all kinds of uh, data that's coming to you. And over the years in vision, we have always uh, been very proud that we'll have handcrafted features that are good for the particular problem, right? So in the early days, it was just interest points. The harris moravec operator, or later on it became SIFT, scale invariant feature transform from David Lowe. In the early 90s, eigen phases, eigen images became good features. These are holistic features. And uh, of course, template matching has been there for a while. And histogram of gradients, uh, you know, surprisingly effective uh, for a number of problems, pedestrian detection and so on. And also, uh, some of us, you know, Professor Krim, myself, 
Uh, we have looked at stochastic models of various kinds, dynamic models of various kinds, deformable models and the dynamic textures and so forth. So the whole idea here is that if you represent the data using this, they will help us to say something about them and so on. And once you have the features, you design various recognition engines, you know, if you have structured data, you can do graph-based matching interpretation trees were proposed by Eric Grimson for 3D object recognition and hashing has been there for a while and of course SVMs and so on. So uh, they work well in many constrained situations, um, you know, and uh, we still had issues with uh, all kinds of variations that happen with patterns, how to develop invariant representations and so on. Uh, we didn't have a lot of data. Uh, I remember when I was doing, uh, you know, my PhD in the late 70s and so on, uh, the data set that was available was the USC uh, signal and image processing data, which was basically scanned the textures from the Broad Arts album and, and some military objects scanned from, you know, James Weekly or something like that, which was good because we, we didn't have to do a lot of comparisons. So, you know, doing PhD in those days was much easier. We just had to do our theory, our algorithm, our results, everybody was happy, right? Because there was not a whole lot of uh, data available. And one million was big. And uh, then what happened was uh, folks like uh, Dr. Lee Dai and so on, who gives out grants, and says, one of it, Chalapa, how do I know that you are doing better? Where is the improvement? Then what happens? Somebody comes up with uh, data, and then you're supposed to run your algorithms and show improvements and things like that. So. This thing was very popular in speech recognition. There were standardized data sets in OCR, but computer vision researchers, we were clever. For a long time, we were telling it's a very hard problem and we are not there yet, so we don't want to be compared. And it worked for a while. <laughs> but then things like Google and other things showed up and people would go to the web and download images and say, oh, well, we can do it now, you know, so Caltech 101. And so a lot of data sets came, uh, which is good actually because we can measure, uh, you know, where the performance is and what works and what doesn't work. Particularly in the face uh, area, we had a program known as FERRET, face recognition technology in the early 90s. Uh, DARPA and ARL got together. First time they produced, you know, systematic data and variations and so on to see how well the verification algorithms work. So the idea was not to actually compare algorithm A and B, but in terms of finding out what was not working and therefore you can slowly build. And Jonathan Phillips, uh, who is now at NIST, he used to be at ARL, was a pioneer in building up, uh, you know, successive uh, challenge problems. It's called Face Recognition Grand Challenge, FRGC. And NIST did a whole bunch of uh, evaluations, FRVD 2000, 2002, and so forth. So, uh, you know, so these this data sets were coming, so we were understanding what the limitations were, right? LFW actually is the last phases in the wild. Uh, basically from, you know, YouTube, uh, somebody would take a face, put a box, and it was unconstrained, right? Um, and then the idea was it was an assembly, um, not an assembly model in the sense if you want to develop an algorithm for face verification, you have to know something about, you know, what the data is, what the phase is, and what variations it undergoes. Typically needed a PhD, okay? Now, this is something I like to say, but for, for a long time, we have been interested in building some kind of a, an espresso machine or a pasta machine for computer vision, right? That a high school kid can work and, you know, produce a penne or spaghetti and so on. We just didn't have it in computer vision. Now we have it. That's called deep network. <laughs> it annoys some people, but some people are very excited that finally we have a box that we can play with. Okay, that's going to be my message. So it is true, it is seen as a black box and so on, but it's a box. You can put something in it and it, does, it produces something that you, most people like. Now we've got to go inside and figure out why it works. But, you know, that's not a very odd thing. Uh, you know, we have a great example. This is first in flight state, right? So, you know, a couple of brothers decided to fly a plane long time ago. That did not kill aerospace research. That just promoted more of it because whoever flies in a plane like that these days or a Model T. So deep networks now, which I'm going to talk about today, you can view them as like Model T, the, 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 the car, uh, the buggy, head, you know, headlights and a, and a park benches as seats and a big steering wheel without doors. We don't drive that car anymore. But the fact that that car was there at the time has helped us to make a lot of progress that we are even thinking of smart cars without drivers, right? So computer vision, our secret desire, although we all like the theory, 
Everybody liked geometry, everybody liked uh, the optimization algorithms and so on, but we wanted a, a, a box, a computer vision box, so that you put the data in, something comes out, and deep networks are providing that. So you can compare a pasta machine to a deep learning machine, right? Uh, a pasta machine, what, you have some place to put the flour, some place to put the oil, the water, the herbs, and so on, and press the button, a penne comes out, okay? So now, we couldn't do it with um, computer vision, although neural networks were popular in the mid-80s. I was at the conference in San Diego, 1987, I believe. Everybody thought 500 people will come, thousands showed up. So it, was, it had its run of 10 years. You know, we were trying all kinds of things. Of course, the theoretical basis was that if you view a classifier as a mapping from data to labels, then it's a kind of a mapping uh, structure. And to the extent that a three-layer network can approximate that mapping to the desired level of accuracy, depending on the number of hidden layers and nodes and so, so on, you should be okay. Now, SVM came and then it did uh, better. But um, so the cycle, if, if you are in the field like 30, 40 years, you see things going, come back. I think it looks like every 20 years, the things come back, right? It's roughly <laughs> two decades. So, um, of course, now it's more dangerous because the current generation doesn't read anything, uh, you know, prior to more than five years. So I think the cycle is going to be every five years now, you're going to see the same thing. I'm not criticizing you, I'm just, uh, you know, in my days at Purdue, I had to take every Friday afternoon a bag of coins to the library and look at all the transactions and the ones I needed, I had to put coins and Xerox them, so Friday afternoons. Now you have the whole library in your um, tablet, right? You just go and Google. Life is easy for you guys, okay? <laughs> As my son used to say, I had to go to school walking five kilometers uphill both ways. Right? That's how we think. Anyway, so it's, it's good. Now, just to set some uh, idea, uh, what is a neural network? Well, it has input nodes, and it has um, the basic three-layer network. It has so-called the hidden nodes, and then you have the output layer, and everything is connected to everything, depending on how much connectivity you want. And then given training data, right, given... Uh, my face, everybody's face, and the labels, the idea is to find out what these weights are. And so back propagation algorithm, uh, it was rediscovered in the mid 80s, but it was already from Paul Verbos' PhD dissertation at Harvard in the mid 70s. So when folks felt that to improve the performance of um, three layer network, they have to add more layers and more layers. If you know the structure of the back propagation algorithm, which is basically a chain rule being applied again and again and again, and as you go from the top of the layer, as you go down, there is a first level, and then second time you have to do another chain rule, another chain rule, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the derivatives were really becoming smaller and smaller, and they really didn't have much impact. So when you increase the layer, and so people were looking at what are the best ways to come up with improved initial conditions when you have deep layers, of course. Of course, then we, the, the idea was you should probably have an unsupervised way of initializing them. And that's where the autoencoder came, which basically takes the input and then wants to find out what are the weights that will produce the same input on the output side. So the network has to reconcile that the inputs and the outputs are the same and whatever value it gets using back prop is something you can use as initial conditions and so on. So these things were being done. In parallel to this, um, Jan LeCun, um, you know, a, a, a person uh, who did his uh, PhD thesis in, in France in the late 80s, was promoting the idea. Computer vision folks spend a lot of time in figuring out what are the best representations. I mean, in, in fact, in vision, we think that is the problem, right? Um, he says, hey, heck with it. You have data. Let the data say what is good for itself, right? So that's the idea of convolutional networks. Okay, the typical structure, this is from his 19... Uh, 98 uh, paper, you know, mo they were doing OCR, I think he was at uh, Bell Labs maybe at the time. So you have basically convolutions and max pooling and, and uh, subsampling being repeated, 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 and then the features are learned, uh, the, the, the weights of the convolution uh, are, are used as representations and so on. And this, uh, you know, even in, in his paper, he showed how these things work and, and so forth. But in the, if you look at the way computer vision developed, computer vision was mostly funded by DARPA Image Understanding Program from 1976 to 1992. So in the mid-80s when neural networks were making a splash, uh, traditional computer vision scientists were a little concerned. 
and of course uh, the DARPA PM at that time was Bob Simpson. He said not to worry, he's not going to fund any neural networks for IU. And then DARPA started a program that was done by Barbara Yoon, uh, automatic target recognition, uh, you know, using neural networks and so forth. So there was this thing, uh, you know, as a computer vision person, I don't like black boxes. Because I like to kind of come up with representations that make sense from neuroscience, from geometry, from illumination models and so on. But the engineering person in me says, well, if a box works, why fight it? You know, take the box, accept it, and then make it better, understand why the box. So there is this uh, push and pull between the two uh, sides of uh, computer vision people. On the one hand, we like to have physics. I mean, there was a whole bunch of years we spent on trying to come up with physics-driven representations. You know, for example, what works for uh, visible spectrum may not work for synthetic aperture radar. And so you have to bring in the physics of image formation in the radar regime and so on. So, uh, you know, this was going on. And uh, so, the, uh, you know, there was a kind of a hesitancy to jump into this idea of let's put the data in and then, you know, let it uh, go, right? But vision people also realize that they have to start doing these large-scale experiments. So ImageNet is one data set which uh, is a lot of object detection millions of, uh, you know, images and so on. The challenges were being held, and LFW is the unconstrained phase. So what happened was, right around 2012, so this is the, um, I like to call the revenge of the deep networks. So a student of uh, Jeff Hinton, you know, ran the, uh, the convolutional neural networks for the ImageNet and suddenly saw significant improvement in performance. You know, it's a kind of a eureka moment for him. And the life of computer vision researcher has not been the same ever since. So it is to the point that 80% of our papers and vision conferences are deep something. You know? Well, uh, I like to say, you know, we can't argue against performance. So that's the, that's the thing, right? We have done many different representations. We have done sparse representations, dictionary learning, and this and that. Now, um, this is, so if you really look at it from a mathematical point of view, what, what is the deep network? It's a large, uh, nonlinear, hierarchical regression machine. That's what it is, the regression structure being defined using convolution operation, right? It's, it's nonlinear because of max pooling, and it's hierarchical. We are now talking about ResNet, which is 101 layers. I'm sure somebody will come up with the 1,008 layer uh, network zone, you know, in in, um, in in Indian mythology, 108, 1008, they're all holy numbers. So I think, uh, I don't know why they start. If it had been in Indian, it would have been 108 layer, because we don't, when, when we reach 101, we want to hit 108. That's a holy number for us, uh, 1008. We'll see one of these days. But the thing is that it has zillions of parameters. Uh, the face net face it. 120 million parameters. I mean, we never worked with a model that had 120 million parameters in a nonlinear thing. So we have absolutely no idea what's going on here. Other than the fact it's easy to cook and it makes good food. <laughs> right. If, if all you want to do is enjoy good food, let's say, right? Enjoy good food. And all you have to do is, you know, you have this machine. You press a button, it, it will give you a tasty meal. Uh, maybe you have to wait a little longer. <laughs> Depends on how many GPUs you have. The training takes time. Uh, then why question it? Just enjoy, right? So that's where we are. And it's, it's uh, yeah, until you get fat. But you have to do exercise. So <laughs> when it is training, you probably should be on the treadmill. Then you'll be okay. But the point is, it's, it's very pe new feeling for us. As a computer vision researcher, we have always told everybody how hard this problem is. And we were quite happy to be <laughs> in that frame. But now, suddenly, we are seeing something that kind of looks like it's working, at least producing much better performance compared to state-of-the-art. And we're a little confused. We don't know what to do. We, have, we never thought we would reach uh, this stage. But it's fun. It's very exciting. I'll tell you later, you know, a high school student can now implement a deep learning machine without a lot of difficulty. And we see that happening, right? So. It's a kind of an equalizer now. It doesn't matter if you are 35 years experience in computer vision. If you are six months out of undergraduate or even high school, and if we teach you how to download CAFE and tell you this data, that label, run it, you will have some results which will be pretty similar to what your uh, aging professor comes up with. 
Right? I thought 35 years of doing something should have some incentives that I should beat the high school kid. But I see that and I think it's exciting because we have a new machine we can play with. Um, but it does not perf it's not perfect yet. It, it relies on tons and tons of training data. We're back into the supervised mode, training data, right? So these are the results you will see everywhere, deep learning, uh, image net classification results, all in the upper 90s. Uh, the LFW is saturated now, 99.79% verification, you know. So uh, it's, it's uh, very interesting. Now, what made it possible? A lot of data because... Uh, Facebook talks about 200 million faces that they use for their CVPR 2014 paper and Google 500 faces of 10 million subjects and so on because the younger generation is not afraid to provide data to Facebook and Google. Whereas I have to work in the university setup and I can't go and ask for faces and I have to work with what is publicly available which is oftentimes half a million Cassia website, you know, databases and so forth. So a lot of data and GPUs. And in the early days of neural network, we talked about, um, you know, sigmoid nonlinearities and so on. Now we're looking at, people have suggested much simpler uh, ones, you know, ReLUs and parametric ReLUs and so forth. So when we uh, started this effort in 2014, we were in the traditional computer vision mode, you know, representations based on Fisher vector encoding and this and that. Uh, the, but the performance level expected was pretty high. Uh, if you have two faces to compare and ask the question or answer the question, do these faces belong to the same person or not? That's the verification protocol. Uh, at 10 power minus 3 false alarm, that means I'm allowed to make 1 in 10 power, uh, 1 in 1,000 mistakes. The accuracy was supposed to be 85%. Okay, 1 in 10 power 3. And with the methods that we had at that time that did not use deep network, the performance was 50%. So we had a, a, a step of 35% improvement that we had to do, okay? And so everybody looked at what was going on in the literature and the four teams, all four at various points in the first six months switched over to deep networks. And I'll tell you, it was very easy, okay? We had the data sets and the training was very easy. And then when you tested it on the data provided by IARPA, it was very easy. At 10 power minus 3, we were actually getting better than what one IARPA expected. So that in phase 2, they made the conditions even harder. At 10 power minus 3, 1 in 1,000 mistakes I can make, I have to be 95% accurate that the two faces are the same person. At 10 power minus 4, 1 in 10 power 4, I should be accurate 85%. We have never worked in these regions before. We've always worked in 1 in 10 power 2. You know, that is the performance. So what deep networks have done, they've moved us to the what I call the dark regions of uh, far tar curves. So the performance is really uh, impressive. But again, I will repeat, we have still not solved the fundamental problem of tackling post elimination expressions. The question we are asking is, how much of diversity in training data set that you need so that you can somehow learn the variations across all these uh, things, okay? So I'll show you some graphs where uh, we are having issues. So uh, this is about building a thing, building a, 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 a system and giving it to you know, folks who are, who are interested in this. And I think, uh, as you can see, as in a traditional uh, you know, verification, thing, we have uh, a phase, you have to detect the phase first. It's an end-to-end -end automated system. So you have to detect a phase and you have to extract the fiducials, points on the face because you're not always going to capture faces that are looking at the camera. So sideways, off frontal, so you have to align them. That's important. And then um, you have various representations. As we started with the dictionaries and then we dropped them after a while. Attributes are very important. They're very intuitive, right? Male, Asian, black hair, you know, bald, balding, etc. eyeglasses. Some are more permanent than the others. We think they're still useful. Um, and then 3D models became very useful. In fact, over the years, we felt if you have to deal with pose variations, illumination variants, being able to have a 3D model of, uh, would be useful because you can synthesize and, and, and things like that. So that's still useful. Fisher vector encoding is, is a traditional computer vision feature and, of course, the DCNN feature. So we, this is an all-university uh, team. Um, you know, Maryland is a lead and under PI, and we have 
good guys from uh, you know, other places. So we, we will tell you a little bit about, now in the, in the early days we were building a network for phase detection. Phase detection is a two class problem, right? Phase, no phase. So you will give a lot of phase examples with bounding boxes and then non-phase objects and you train a network. And then if you want fiducial extraction, it is a regression problem. Okay, pose estimation is a regression problem. Now, gender is a classification problem. Now, classification and regression are two sides of the same coin. Actually, you can take the regression output and quantize it and get your uh, classifier output. Okay, so you, you can view them as two sides of the same coin. Now, we have these multiple networks, and of course, each required its own uh, training data sets. One thing you will notice is that for verific for detection, there is a lot of data. But for fiducial, there's not that much data because somebody has to go and put the markers on the face. It takes time. So for these different tasks, you have different levels of training data. If you do not have a lot of annotated data, deep learn, learning will not do much for you. I and mean, that's a fact, okay? Traditional methods can do. So the idea here is that, you know, you have to have a lot of data. So we, we came up with a method where we wanted to do all these tasks as in a multitask learning framework. In, in, instead of doing them uh, separately, we want to combine them. The whole idea is when you look at these deep layers for features, right, the bottom layers, they are very generic. They're more like detecting blobs and Gabor transforms and so on. As you move up the, the tree uh, 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 the network, you become more specific to the data, more specific to the particular task. So the bottom features are something that are shareable across multiple task, okay? For example, if I want to do face verification and expression recognition, then I can actually use some of the layers as common for both. Now, the question is which layers are, are useful? Which layers are amenable for transfer learning or domain adaptation is the one. So here, we, we build this network. So you just give a picture. It will tell you where the face is. It will approximately give you the age. It's a regression problem. And it will give you the pose pitch, yaw, and roll, and it will give you uh, expression, smile or not, you know, not smiling, and uh, it also gives you a gender, okay? So we can get all in one shot. So, well, how do you do that is you have to define different, if, this is again set in the back propagation network, right? Some of the tasks are, are uh, you know, based on the subject, some are not, right? Age is based on the subject but the pose, okay, you, it's, it's not dependent on who the person is. Pose is just a geometric thing. So you can divide them into two different uh, uh, sets of tasks and you come up with uh, where different loss functions. So we can use the typical cross entropy loss or the soft max loss, uh, you know, for classification problems and Euclidean loss for regression problems, okay. So once you specify them, and then you crank the engine. The only question here is that how many layers do you want to use? Well, there is a new uh, thing that everybody is using called ResNet, which has 101 layers. I, I like uh, many small networks, and I like to, you know, each one of them to become good in what it does. And then you have to start putting the information together. Because if you just have one layer, very, very large, uh, you know, number of layers, the training requirements are more and also it becomes too specific to that particular problem and it cannot generalize. This is a classical issue of you fit very well, but then you don't predict well or you don't generalize well, right? So that's what we prefer. And we typically don't go more than 15 layers, 11 layers, and so on. Um, okay, so as I, as I told you, for different tasks, you have uh, different kinds of amounts of training data and the performance can change. So these are the various uh, loss functions uh, we have used. And, um, it, you know, in the early days, uh, the training was uh, bothersome. It took time, but now it's okay. So, um, of course, uh, people, some like uh, rock curves and many don't like rock curves, but uh, that kind of tells you where you are. And what you will see again and again is just in a matter of months, um, by changing the uh, network structure, by improving the diversity of data and so on, the curve seems to getting better and better. That's one thing you will notice with the... Uh, with deep learning method. So, you know, we have uh, July 2016 and uh, January 2017, right? So you see the improvement. Now, one of the things that, that happens is that if you can't uh, detect a face, okay, this again, you know, improvement. If you can't detect a face, there's not a whole lot you can do. So there's a lot of already, you know, algorithms available uh, in literature 
these are the different uh, data set. That's, this is again a new thing in computer vision. Over the last 10 years, we have really, in the early years of the field, we were happy proving theorems and all that. Now we run a lot of experiments. It has become a kind of an experiment-driven field. Um, and if, if you, uh, I know I'm being recorded, but this is a fact. If you submit papers to our premier vision conferences, if you are not at least 3% better on, on data sets, it just doesn't make it. And so now we have to tell the reviewers, please don't reject a paper because it's not 3% better. Look at the ideas. I mean, we didn't have to say that before. <laughs> I said, it's okay if it's not in a state of the art. At least the ideas are novel. I mean, let's try it out and maybe it'll get better. Oh boy. No. <laughs> Everybody looks at, okay, it's not, that's it, numbers, state of the game. You know, compression used to be like this. I used to joke that if you have, uh, in image compression studies in the 80s, we used to use PSNR, peak signal to noise ratio as a, as a metric. And we used to say if it is 0.5 dB better, it's a conference paper and I see, I see 1 to 3 dB, it's a journal paper, 5 to 10 dB, it's a technical achievement award. Because in compression, we always measure the, the reconstruction error, peak signal to noise ratio. And vision people, we used to make fun of that, but now we are in this situation. So only as, as a bare minimum, now you have to have three data sets and five algorithms you have to compare. But, but most of the time, we don't have to run the other algorithm. There's a public website available. You can go and uh, put your numbers in. And, and another thing with deep networks, you probably are the best maybe for a day or for a week. <laughs> Somebody else comes and beats you up, you know, it moves. It, it's just, it's a very f strange time right now. So I like to say, you know, if you climb Mount Everest, of course, it's not like you are the last person to do it. Somebody else will do it a day later or maybe on the same day. But everybody gets the credit for being on Mount Everest, but here you get knocked off. If somebody else climbs, that means you are off the list. So it's tough. And another issue we face is we have you know, students, and um, we, we started an undergraduate machine learning course because it's just all this demand from students. Who, when are we going to learn deep learning, right? And so then we go through the basics, Bayesian decision theory, and this and then. And the kids, when are we doing deep learning networks? So it's, a, it's an interesting uh, situation in, in computer vision. Okay, so you can do the fiducials. Fiducials are important. Alignment is very important. Um, if you don't align them well, then you can match the features properly. Post information is useful um, because you can uh, develop post sensitive um, networks and so on. So gender is working very well, right? Gender is, um, you know, we are pretty good at, uh, sometimes when you are off rental, uh, gender doesn't work that well. Age estimation, again, uh, this is on one particular data set. Um, you can, you know, if, if you have other variations like illumination and so on, the age can be, but mean absolute error in age estimation is about less than three or four years, so it is getting uh, better, okay? So, and we can actually run this uh, thing for verification, and um, you can see um, that the numbers are, uh, you know, 82 percent and so on at 10 power minus, uh, you know, 4 10 power minus 3, 92 percent, and things like that. So there are two tasks. One is the verification. Given two faces are the same. Another one is, can you rank order, you know, all these faces in terms of how close they are in the gallery and, uh, you know, the top 20 and so forth. So we have some metrics to face there. So these are the sample outputs. You can see, given a face, we can right away produce, uh, if you know the name, if the person is already enrolled, we can say who that person is. And then we can put the box, and we can um, give a rough age, fiducials, and it works for uh, quite a uh, bit of variations in pose and so on, even the totally uh, pro profile views and so forth, right? So we use this as a, as a front end to um, get the uh, face boxes and get all the other information, okay? Now, so... What we learn from here is, is uh, alignment is, is still very, very uh, important. And, uh, you know, how do you, uh, and again, there are uh, many uh, various uh, uh, synergy across phase related tasks, right? Uh, because we do share features across pose estimation, across gender, and, and so on. So that is a very useful thing to do. It's, it's like, you know, students getting together before the midterm and final and study. How, is group studying still popular? 
No? No, you all become very uh, introvert, no? Well, you know, students will sit together with Starbucks coffee and, you know, they're, they're preparing for the exam, supposedly, and then they're helping each other out and they all are supposed to get A's. That's the whole idea of multitask learning, right? Helping each other and, and so on. So now we, we also have a video as part of the data set. So how do you ma match videos? You know, given two videos, can you say who's in it and so on? So for that, you have to do the, the, the tracking, detection and the tracking of the face. And um, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it works reasonably well. And I can show you uh, some examples. And I hope this uh, thing, excuse me. Uh, I seem to have, oh, why it, it should work. Hmm, this is odd. Ah, there you go. I was looking. So we can put labels on, on people um, and, and then, you know, recapture them and maintain uh, the labels consistency across the, uh, Okay, so here is is fine, and uh, now w when it comes to video, the one of the things that the uh, the IARPA Janus program Janus is the name of the program introduces. That traditionally, we either did still, single image or a video, but they introduced the notion of template. The idea is that an image analyst may get a single picture or may get multiple stills or may get a video. So the idea of template is you, it could be any one of those things. How do you extract a representation? If it is a single image, no problem. We just run the deep features and we get it. If you have a video, then you have a phase in each frame and you track them and you get these features. How do you collapse them to get one feature, the so-called the flattening of the features? Remember, when, when it is across the video, there's post variations, illumination variation. So we still are not sure what is the best way to do it. If you look at how temporal information is processed to, using neural networks, there's a recurrent neural networks and there's LSTMs and so on, but still we have a problem in terms of how to handle uh, videos in the context of deep networks. Um, that's still an open problem. So then we have to build a, a verification engine because we have detected the box, we know where the face is. So we work with, work with two kinds of uh, networks, one that has close to 40 uh, million uh, parameters, other one is seven. The idea was alignment is always an issue and you know, it's not very clear whether we can get perfect alignment results. So we want one network that is a little bit more relaxed in terms of being tolerant to errors in alignment and one that assumes alignment is very good and therefore uh, close cut. So you can basically think of other kinds of uh, uh, networks. One can be very uh, good with pose, one can be good with illumination and so on. So the multiple things and then you, you, you know, have a fusion uh, method to uh, put the results together. So the training is pretty uh, straightforward. Well, not quite. Many times you have errors in labels. So one of the things that we have to know is what is the tolerance uh, for uh, labeling errors, right? That the w only data set we had was Cassia web face. This came from a, a, a Chinese uh, entity. And, uh, but that was not enough because it was mostly frontal and so on and uh, not as unconstrained as we would like. So we decided to develop our own database known as, database known as UMD data sets. Now, when you have these deep layers, the dimensionality of the feature vector can be pretty high and you have to come up with a method for compressing the dimensionality. There are a couple of methods. One is in a joint base. Other one is known as triplet uh, probabilistic embedding. This is, the, the triplet embedding is something that uh, folks at UPenn, when Lawrence Saul was UPenn, you know, he developed. The idea is, I'm the anchor, my face, and there are my faces, maybe with variations in pose and illumination, and there's everybody else's face. So come up with an embedding or a transformation that will keep all of my faces together in a cluster and separate them from faces from others. So this is why it's called triplet. My face, my, an my face, uh, other variations of my face, and then everybody else's face. There is this triplet. So you define uh, a transformation, and uh, that reduces the, the dimensionality of the feature. We are, so, okay, we train using this uh, data set, you know, it's a UMD. We are slowly getting into the million um, uh, range, you know. The idea is to have about 
5 to 10 million of these annotated uh, faces to train our uh, networks. Uh, so this is the triplet uh, embedding and uh, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty standard technique for reducing feature uh, dimension. Of course, when you have multiple layers, you can also uh, fuse them and this is again something that uh, is uh, not too difficult uh, in terms of performance. And what we find is every time we bring a different network that has been trained differently, the numbers go up. One option was to make, take one network and then make it deeper and deeper. Better than that is to uh, go uh, you know, with multiple networks and fuse them. Okay, so this is the task. IARPA is a, you know, it's a new agency, relatively speaking, compared to DARPA and others. Um, it's, it's, they, they support fundamental research, but they also want the fundamental research to work on difficult problems. Okay. It's like trying to be NSF and DARPA at the same time. Okay? It's, it's hard. I mean, I think I like that because I have always felt the most difficult mathematical, practical problems require the most interesting mathematics. Right? So I can't assume goes in everywhere because I know how to do that math. Okay, so practical problems require you know, good mathematics. So I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. So look at it. It's huge. I mean, a million comparisons and, and all that stuff. So the first one is just one-to-one -one comparison. Next one is one-to-one -one comparison when you have changes in pose, uh, when you have changes in illumination, changes in resolution, etc. That's what we call them as covariates. And then four and five, task three disappeared. I'm not sure what happened. Uh, four and three is when you have um, ranking, recognition, open set problem, okay? It can have uh, stills, it can have uh, both mixed. That means it can have still multiple stills. And the sixth one is just videos. And then if I'm given a, a picture of a lot of faces, I want to be able to say how many different faces there are, subject clustering, and the task eight is subject clustering in the wild. That means you should automatically detect. And the idea in phase two is to build an automated system, okay? So, of course, we have a lot of phase uh, data sets that we evaluate, um, you know. Um, now, this, this is the, the difficult one. Um, it's called IJBA. And if you look at everything is DCNN, right? CNN of various configurations and so on. And uh, numbers are, like rank five, 10 is 97 percent, rank 1 is 9 percent. If you look at the top plots, you will see at e power minus 2, 83 percent. This is uh, about a year old, and we don't work with uh, IJPA or CS2 anymore. We work with uh, CS3. Now, this, this plot is, this, this table is important because if you look at a number, the, the leftmost column, okay, or my rightmost column, e power minus 3, it was 51 percent. Right? That was the traditional computer vision method. Now we are operating at uh, 81 and so on. And anything that is in the 80s is CNN. So if, if you are in a competition with uh, other teams and if they use deep networks and if you don't, you are in trouble. Now how do you fix that one? Right? So whether he, the question is, you know, that's uh, again the problem here is the performance. Right? Look, look at e power minus 3. 80 percent, 76 percent, if you have EPR, whereas if you look at uh, 75, it's 51. In the early days, it was 65, 49, and so on. And then the moment, Nan is the one from Ganghua, and he has better numbers now. But my point is, with, without deep networks, we will not even think of going to 10 power minus 4. Now, how does that matter? For people in operational worlds, that's what they want. They don't want to have to be seen as making too many mistakes, right? So one in 10 power four. So if you talk to somebody who uses uh, this phase verification as part of their regular work, they want us to do 10 power minus four and 10 power minus five. I can tell you, I know it's being recorded. I cannot do it using traditional methods that we were doing before deep networks came. So there is always this love hate relationship in fact, to the extent that people who secretly like deep networks, but outside we have to kind of say, yeah, we know it's a black box and we got to fix it and so on. But inside they are happy they are using deep networks, which is a very, very interesting thing because it's, it's, the, it's the performance and easily trainable. It takes time, but there's not big magic. If you have the correct data set with labels, you let it go, right? Now, 
this is something I, I uh, again I want to point out. This is CS3 is, is the most challenging uh, data set right now. Look at e power minus 5, 1 in 100,000 mistakes I can make. COTS1, COTS1 is one of the commercial uh, thing. Performance accuracy is 1.6%. Okay. Uh, now, um, GOTS is something that the government got from a company. It's a famous company bought by another more famous company. I can't tell you who that is. We're talking about 19.4. Now, if you go to e power minus 4, we were at 14.8. Right? Now, with Maryland, it's 78.6. This is the highest performance now. Just think of 14.8 uh, is um, what now the people in government are using for matching at 10 power. Now, they would like to have the algorithm that produces 78 point, and they already have it. They are able to give the system we built, and they are able to run within a day. And it, it was never that easy with computer vision, that we will build an end-to-end -end system, automated system, complete end-to-end, -end, and it will do this performance. And it is easily, I always felt, in university, we do technology transition if my code runs in the other room. You know, I thought I have succeeded because, you know, somehow code stops working the moment the students graduate. Professors, have you wondered about that? Suddenly the links are not there. And then he got a call and the, he said, yeah, I'll look into it. He's making already 120,000 in Google. He doesn't care anymore or she doesn't care anymore. This thing is easy to train. So you look at the fact, if you have the data for your problem, it's easy to build this network, easily trainable, and then this network will run in somebody else's. It's the question is whether you are using CAFE or Torch or Tiano or TensorFlow. Yeah, those are details. And this is very interesting for us because we never were in this position before. You know, that something would be practically happening. Now, covariates is the case where you have all kinds of variations. Obviously, it's going to go down, the performance, okay? compared to it. So I'll show you what the plots look like. So I think this is the time for us to celebrate it. All right? Um, this is the time to celebrate that I have a machine. Now I can go and, and tickle it and, and slap it and pinch it and see what happens. I didn't have that before, right? So, uh, so look at the plots. Look, look at ten performance again. 10 power minus 4, I was at 60%. That was in June 2016. Now I'm at 80%. This is what? February, March, March. So it's amazing, right? Um, now, in fact, um, they're, they're trying to build a GUI over uh, this, this uh, software, right? So covariates is going to go down, um, all comparison. Just to give you one example of a co covariate, eyes visible, eyes not visible. For example, I have two faces to compare. Both have eyes visible. That means they are kind of looking frontal or not too off frontal. Or both have eyes not visible. That means extreme profiles. Or one has eyes visible and one doesn't. So that's the code for minus one, zero, and one. And you can see depending on, now we can understand where are we are having issues. Because 10 power minus four, when if the eyes are, uh, one is visible, not visible, we are only operating at 40%. So that's not good. So we need to look into the fact Deep networks are still having problems with post variations. That's what this tells us, okay? And you have to go through the whole uh, series of uh, plots like this to understand. Now, it is a fact that this is all empirical. Why is it empirical? Again, it's a highly nonlinear hierarchical regression machine. And statistical regression is great for linear regression methods or nonlinear regression methods, maybe one step. But if you start doing things on top of each other, on top of each other, like the convolutional neural networks, it becomes very difficult to understand what, what it is doing. But it's not like not to give up. It's an opportunity for us. In fact, in the early days of neural network, people were calculating the capacity of a network to see whether, you know, from information theory, all of those things are still applicable. So the field is wide open for control people, for information theories, for signal processing folks, and so on. Because it's, uh, it is good to analyze something that works, right? It's good to analyze something that works so that you can make it better. Because by no means, 
phase verification is solved by, by irrespective of these performances because we still have issues with all the covariates. Now, this is a search that means you have to give an, uh, my phase and then I'm enrolled. What is the, uh, you know, ordering rank one? How often do I get Chalapa as rank one, rank five, rank two, and so forth? As you can see, the numbers are pretty encouraging. I think we are supposed to reach 95% rank 20 in phase two, we are already there, okay? And uh, task six is uh, complicated. Basically, it's a video. The analyst will put a box in the first video on one of the phases, and we need to take it from there, okay? That's uh, uh, looking for somebody. And again, here, rank 10, rank, rank 20 is 83. It's unconstrained video, so it's a, it's a harder problem, okay? Now, phase detection, as, as you know, you cannot do it without detecting. One of my uh, partners is uh, Deva Ramanan at CMU. He is very interested in getting small faces, very small, okay? It's called, there is a data set known as wider face. Um, usually we don't uh, do faces that have less than 20 pixels in them. Five minutes? Oh, okay. So, um, oh, I see. I'm used to 11 to 12, and I'm looking at that. I said, I still have 25 minutes. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Okay. So face detection and uh, now what happens if you don't have a lot of data? Well, can you build a model and then synthesize? This is being pursued by a couple of folks, but this assumes you have a very good picture to build a model and uh, that is one thing. Now, the other question is, do I really have to use zillions of training data? Suppose I have already trained a network and I know how well it works on the data I have. I have a way of characterizing the classification accuracy. Then I have a thousand phase from the training. How much of the thousand phase I should use, okay? So we can formulate this as an optimization problem by using the following constraints. We like to have in the batch data set that is uniform across the classes and that encourages uh, hard samples you know, if you are interested in doing well in classification and so on. So you can create, um, I'm going to rush through these things. It's an archive paper. So you can characterize the classifier uncertainty and then you can ca do the uh, so-called water filling algorithm from information theory to pr provide a balanced representation from the training sample. And then we do what all of us do, throw it into an optimization problem and then come up with a strategy. So to give you an idea of these results for phase, I don't want to do the MNIST, let's go to the phase. If I emphasize that I want to have good pictures to represent faces to represent each class, these are the samples I choose, you know, really nice looking ones. Whereas if I want hard cases so that I can discriminate better, you can do the side and with the glasses and with the funny thing on the nose and so on. So. Uh, you, you, these are the things that we are looking at now because not everybody wants to use, not all training data is good, right? If you have just billion faces of me looking at frontal, it's not going to be great. Now, the next two, three slides are just some of our recent conference papers that are going to appear. We have a good method for fiducials and a good method for clustering of faces. This all represents one guy and, you know, so you, you continue to get a face of this person, a lot of people. You want to put them in the right basket, irrespective of illumination, pose, and all those variations. So that's a big problem for uh, the intelligence community. And of course, when you use cell phones, the faces are not full. They're partial. They're occluded. How do you handle? So we do segment-based detection and then and fuse them. And this is an interesting example. When you have a very good face verification network, and then you want to do expression, what you will do is if you do fine tuning, which means, you know, just use the new data, it's not clear it's a great strategy because the network has not forgotten that it was trained to verify. So how do you unlearn, make the network not to learn and then learn new things? We still don't know, right? Um, okay, because we, we are saying, right, you can teach uh, new tricks to the old whatever. Now that's what we have to figure out. Open issues. Deep networks are here to stay. I, I like to think so because there is plenty of theory to be done. And uh, it's a great equalizer. Okay, so you, um, we still have issues incorporating invariances, occlusions, and the training data. And, and uh, Steve Mala is slowly beginning to do some work on 
uh, representation and so forth. And we are interested in domain um, adaptation. Basically, you design a classifier using training data, but the test data has a different distribution. How do you adapt it? It's a, it's a big problem. It's an age-old problem. What we don't understand in deep networks is which layers are amenable to adaptation. That changes for the problem. So there are still a lot of uh, interesting things to do. I, uh, I got uh, lost track of my time. I looked at the watch and I said, okay, I still have uh, one, but I forgot it is quarter. quarter to one. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take your questions. Questions? Yeah. So you, you talked about that uh, little max function. Do you have any intuition why that uh, linearity is I think better than the uh, sigmoid function? Purely empirical. Yeah, purely empirical. Yeah. That's and um, nowadays. Then making the um, each network bigger, but then how do we ensure that we're not overfitting into the data because the bigger the network, you know, the more pathways it has. So how do we know it's not learning the data? But empirical, empirical, because it's a, it's a beast. You said that you would like to stay away from ResNet because it has so many layers. Right, but because the general feeling is if if a, if a network is too tuned you know, to a problem, then it doesn't generalize well. So that, that's, an, that's a kind of a thumb rule in, in, the, uh, in the field, right? So we like to have a lot of little, uh, the, the analogy I gave is, you know, I'm, since I'm being recorded, I won't mention that, but if somebody is too uh, ingrained in one way of thinking, you can't change them much. So you have to work with people who are willing to listen to new things and they can uh, change. So that's the whole idea instead of one, because a big network requires a lot of training data also, it takes time to train. So we think uh, this way, I, maybe I can have one network that just worries about elimination issues, then I can give it the proper, um, you know, data, maybe a lot of data with just elimination, it becomes very good at that. Another network will say, I'm only going to deal with posts, and one will say this, and then, you know, when something comes, they're all going to get together and they decide, and then, so it's like having experts. You know, in each, uh, you know, it's like a, like a, I don't know, I don't know if this analogy is any better, a hospital, let's say, you know, you have one doctor in the old days did everything, now you have specialists. And so your person comes in and then they, they do, and okay, well, this thing should probably go to orthopedics and that one should go to cardio. I think I like that better. That's, that's where I think we are getting benefits compared to uh, some of the other groups. Uh, please, yeah. So what is your... Uh, uh, so when you say have small, lots of small neural networks, how big is that specialist neural network? Uh, I think I'm stuck, stuck less than 15 layers. Okay. Yeah, 11 to so 15. If you look at AlexNet, it's 7, I think. Um, yeah, right. So I think 9 to 15 is okay. Uh, and again, different tasks have different amounts of training data, annotated data available, so that also kinds of restricts you. But I think we have stayed, although some of our partners are using ResNet, which is fine. Um, uh, Terry Bold at uh, Colorado Springs is using ResNet, so he's uh, 101 and more layers. So again, I can keep that as additional thing because score level fusion, you know, the feature level fusion you can now do with different networks. I think that that's where we are seeing improvements because they all have slightly different um, data set that been trained on, and it cap basically the idea is to capture diversity. You know, if you want invariance, right? Either you make the method invariant to variations, or you just uh, present all possible things to that, so hopefully it picks up something. After all, it's a regression model, you know, so that's, that's what I think. Yes? I wonder, do you have any comments for how to adapt those kind of deep learning methods to handle this so-called lifelong learning? So instead of trying to address the isolated task, right? Mm -hmm. Suppose you have a trivial task, and how can you continue learning instead of Right, right. Sure. Uh, you know, the, the whole idea is that there is a lot of faith still. Fine tuning is one way to go. Um, and we have seen it for closely related problems from verification to expression uh, network. Uh, but if you take 
uh, ResNet, exa for example, was developed for object uh, recognition problem. And then if you straight away apply it to face, it may not produce the best results because, you know, uh, faces smile and, 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 and faces uh, have different kind of you know, non-rigid transformation. So um, that's where some of those issues come, you know, which layers you want to keep, which you want to throw. Uh, but I think um, online uh, learning mechanism, uh, but again, this is all depending on uh, as time progresses. Right? First, for, for example, first I can build a network for frontal, well illuminated and so on. And then maybe I can feed in things that are not so well illuminated and then pose I think it's slowly, uh, you know, you, you can do that by adding layers and, and providing the proper data. I think it's, it's capable. It is capable for that. The, the trick is how to let videos flow through network. That we still have issues. Action recognition problem, for example, is very tricky. You know, we don't, we don't know yet how to do it. Yes? Yeah? Uh, so do you have any idea about the training time for your network, say, like uh, 15 layers? So what's the training oh, time? Oh, these days, you know, we just spend a lot of money. NVIDIA is very happy with us. So let me yeah, put it that way. So it's, it's a couple of days, Max. Yeah, a couple of days. So Before, early days of program, it took me, my students, where is the number? He said, oh, sir, it's still training. So weeks, it took two weeks sometimes. But now everything is down to a couple of days, worst case. Yeah, so for this case, what about, say, like the doctor who said, so we do some online learning. So y if that's the case, you want to, like, fine tune your model again. So that would like take another like several days. No, no, no. Fine-tuning is usually uh, less than a day, a few hours. Yeah. Oh. The only building from scratch, it takes a couple of days now. So do you think there are some like techniques you need to do like tuning per side to reduce the, the time or even reduce the... Very simple technique. Buy more GPUs. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, we have a, you know, um, we, I, that's what I, where I spend my money. When you have a very large contract, like the, the Janus program for four years is 14 million, so I can go to my dean and ask for cost share accounts. Am I still being recorded? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they give money and you buy GPUs. <laughs> no, with, without GPUs, I'm, I'm, kidding, I'm not kidding you. It just would not have been possible. You can't run, uh, you know, 15 layer network on CPU. Takes, Days, weeks, yeah. yeah right, right. But that's not a, that's also hard to do, right? That's true, but I get them as interns to my lab, so it's accessible to them. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll ask the last question since I'm the host here. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can ask the last question even if you're not the host. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, um, we have to put an end to it. Yeah. So, the, 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 the question I have yeah. is if we're after this, uh, as you well put it, after these numbers, these three percent, and uh, we're all running after these numbers. When do we have time to actually try to think and understand what's not understandable about these buildings? Well, That's my concern. Uh, no, no, you should not be concerned because when I look at the covariates, I know clearly where I'm having issues. So my next version will address that precisely, right? The thing is this, if you have a, a method that does not produce good results. And we can continue to analyze it. It's not a lot of interest to anybody. But if you have a method that produces good numbers on what is considered to be a very difficult problem, which is unconstrained phase verification, then I can go and break it open and I can come up with, so which, which option is the one I want? Do I want to spend my theory on something that's not producing numbers for a problem? Because everything is limited. You know, funding agencies also want to see something that they can talk about, especially, you know, somebody like IARPA. So if I have a choice between a method that, that produces acceptable numbers and I don't know now how it works, I have a scope, I have a chance that make it understand because basically we all want to do that. You know, even companies, when they have boxes, they want to know what's going on. They have R&D effort, right? And for professors, that's what drives us. So I don't think that's a problem. I, I'm happy that I have this because kids are excited and people are learning, and it's a very, very difficult mathematical problem, right? I, I like to tell my students, there's no problem that does not have mathematics. It's only left to our, our imagination in terms of theory and mathematics. Every problem, you know, if we don't see it, it's our limitation. <laughs> you know, Lee can say that. I mean, he's, he's pushing all kinds of muries out. So 
there is so what I'm saying with with uh, deep networks, it's true. Right now, it, that's what it is. That's why I say it's like Model T, Ford car or a Wright Brothers plane. But there is so much scope in it, and it, it actually produces better numbers than what we have, state of the art methods and vision. I say, you know, it's okay. It's, it's not it's not bad. Take it, absorb it, hug it, and play with it, and see. You know, it's getting better. There's more and more you are seeing where there's a whole community which is dedicated to beating neural networks, right? They'll tell you, if I give a phase with the nose twisted this way, you fall apart. Sure, adversarial things. But we come up with strategies for that, how to cope. Because it's, it's a learning thing. All learning methods are prone to fail if you don't teach properly. Well, that's my point. I mean, yeah. if, the, right. if the race is for numbers. Right. No, the race is for numbers because it provides oxygen for you to continue for a few more years. If it turned out that deep networks again produce only the same performance as, um, you know, HOG, it probably would not have mattered much. So I think you need uh, both. Um, and as I said, I, when I look at a thing, I, I don't instinctively dismiss it saying, oh, there is no theory yet. Maybe now. But then that reflects on us, not on the problem. It's a, it's a nonlinear, hierarchical. Well, I, I, do believe, <laughs> I, I do believe that. So, you know, we don't know much about it. What more can you ask? Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I think, you know, we are in the early stages, right? With three years, two years. So I think there is scope. Let's thank us.